When you think of Vikings, what comes to mind? Is it their iconic longships cutting through the icy North Atlantic? Or their reputation as fierce warriors and skilled traders? Maybe it's their mythology, filled with gods like Thor and Odin. Vikings have been a source of fascination and intrigue for centuries, and today we're going to delve into some of the most interesting stories from their past. We'll voyage across the ocean to the Americas, journey to the heart of the Byzantine Empire, and even delve into the world of the Viking slave trade. So, fasten your seatbelts, or should I say, secure your oars, as we set sail on this adventure into Viking history. And now, we've all been taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America, right? Well, that might not be the whole truth. In fact, there's a whole saga, quite literally, about Viking explorers reaching the American continent about 500 years before Columbus. This extraordinary tale begins with a Viking named Bjarni Hjolfsson, who was blown off course while sailing from Norway to Greenland and spotted a land that was not on any map. While he didn't land, his tales of this discovery inspired another explorer, Leif Eriksson, to set out on his own expedition. Leif Eriksson, the son of Eric the Red, who founded the first Viking settlements in Greenland, embarked on a journey westward from Greenland. He first landed in a rocky, barren place he named Helluland, believed to be modern-day Baffin Island. From there he ventured further to a forested area he called Markland, likely Labrador in present-day Canada. But it's his final stop that's most intriguing. Ericsson and his crew came upon a place with fertile land, plentiful timber and a climate milder than they were used to. They called it Vinland, or Wineland, likely because of the wild grapes they found. Today most historians agree that Vinland was probably located in what is now Newfoundland, Canada. This site, known as Lance O' Meadows, was excavated in the 1960s, and the remains of Viking buildings were discovered, providing the first archaeological proof of Europeans reaching the American continent. So, while we may think of Columbus Day as a celebration of the discovery of America, perhaps we should also give a nod to Leif Erikson, who appears to have beaten Columbus to the punch by about half a millennium. That's quite a twist in our understanding of history, isn't it? We've all heard of Viking longships, right? These iconic vessels with their dragon-headed prows cutting through the icy waves of the North Sea are nothing short of an engineering marvel, especially when you consider the time period. But let's dive a little deeper into what made these ships so extraordinary. The Vikings were master shipbuilders, and their longships were a testament to their skill and ingenuity. These ships, often reaching up to 75 feet in length, were primarily built from oak, which provided both durability and flexibility. What's remarkable about their design is the shallow draft hull. This allowed them to navigate not only the open ocean, but also to travel up shallow rivers, effectively turning landlocked cities into coastal targets. Imagine seeing a fleet of Viking ships coming up your local river. Quite the terrifying sight. What's more, the symmetry of the longship design meant that they could easily reverse direction without having to physically turn around, a tactical advantage in both exploratory voyages and warfare. The ships were propelled by both oars and a single large square sail. The sail was typically striped, with the colours representing the particular Viking clan. When the ships were in battle, the sail would be taken down so it wouldn't obstruct the view of the Vikings on board. But it's not all about warfare and raiding. These ships were also the primary method for trade, exploration and even colonisation. The same ships that would bring terror to coastal towns in Europe would also be used to establish settlements in distant lands, from the icy shores of Greenland to the verdant meadows of Vinland. So, when we think of the Vikings, it's not just the horned helmets and battle axes that should come to mind, but also these impressive ships. These long ships weren't just a means of transport, they were a symbol of the Viking spirit, adventurous, fearless and unstoppable. Truly, without their ships, the Vikings would not have made the far-reaching impact they did on the world. As we peel back the layers of Viking history, we come across some unsettling truths. For instance, the Vikings were heavily involved in the slave trade, but these weren't just any slaves. They were called thralls in Old Norse, and they were considered property, much like other commodities of the time. The thralls came from all walks of life— they were prisoners of war, debtors, or simply individuals who had been kidnapped during Viking raids. These raids weren't only for plundering gold or silver. They were also for capturing people, who would then be sold in the bustling slave markets across the Viking world and beyond. 
Life as a thrall was undeniably harsh. They were subjected to hard labor, often working in the fields, homes, or workshops of their Viking masters. They had no personal rights and were completely at the mercy of their owners. However, it's also important to mention that the children of thralls were not automatically considered thralls themselves. They could, under certain circumstances, gain their freedom. But the Viking slave trade didn't just serve the internal needs of their society. It was an integral part of their economy, connecting them to the broader world. Thralls were often traded for other goods or even for silver in the places like Dublin or in the bustling markets of the Islamic Caliphate. The role of the Vikings in the slave trade provides a sobering contrast to the heroic and adventurous image we often associate with them. It serves as a reminder that history, much like the people it studies, is multifaceted, and even societies that have left us with marvels of exploration and craftsmanship can also leave behind darker legacies. As we delve deeper into the world of the Vikings, it's important to keep this complexity in mind. It might seem strange to think that Viking warriors, known for their fierce independence and seafaring skills, would end up in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. But history is full of surprising twists and turns, and this is one of them. In the 10th century, the Byzantine Emperor, seeking to bolster his personal guard, invited Norse warriors to join his ranks. This unit would become known as the Varanian Guard, and it was composed primarily of men from Scandinavia and later from England. The Varangian Guard had a reputation for loyalty, bravery, and martial prowess, making them the perfect bodyguards for the Byzantine emperors. They were not only defenders of the emperor, but also active participants in Byzantine military campaigns. This interaction led to a fusion of cultures with Viking runic graffiti found in the Hagia Sophia, the Grand Cathedral of Constantinople, alongside Christian symbols. And moreover, the guard served as a sort of military elite, a status symbol for the emperor. They imagined burly, axe-wielding Vikings standing sentinel in the opulent halls of the Byzantine palace, a testament to the emperor's power and reach. However, it wasn't just about military prowess. The Vikings who travelled to Constantinople and those who served in the Varangian Guard, played a significant role in establishing trade routes between the Norse world and the Byzantine Empire, leading to a rich cultural exchange. The story of the Varangian Guard underscores the Vikings' far-reaching influence and the fluidity of cultural and political alliances in the ancient world. It serves as a testament to the complex and intertwined nature of history. The Vikings, often viewed as pillagers and invaders, were also explorers, traders, and even imperial guards in the heart of one of history's most powerful empires. It's yet another surprising chapter in the saga of the Vikings. When we think of Vikings, we often picture burly men with long beards and horned helmets. But did you know that some of the most feared Viking warriors were women? Known as shield maidens, these women stood alongside their male counterparts in battle, a departure from the gender norms of many other societies of the time. The concept of the shield maiden is steeped in Norse mythology. The Valkyries, warrior maidens who served Odin, are perhaps the most famous. They decided who would die in battle and who would be taken to Valhalla, the hall of fallen warriors. But shield maidens were not mere myth. Historical and archaeological evidence points to their existence and role in Viking society. One of the most famous shield maidens was Lagatha, wife of the legendary Viking hero Ragnar Lothbrok. According to the sagas, Lagatha was a fierce and formidable warrior. She fought in battles, led men, and was known for her bravery and skill. In 2017, archaeologists discovered a Viking warrior's grave in Birka, Sweden. The grave, filled with weapons, two horses, and gaming pieces, suggested a high-ranking warrior. For a long time, it was assumed that the skeleton was male. However, DNA testing revealed that the warrior was in fact a woman— this discovery challenged long-held assumptions about gender roles in Viking society and provided compelling evidence of the existence of female Viking warriors. The role of shield maidens in Viking society was not just about their ability to fight. It reflected a certain level of gender equality in Viking society, at least in comparison to other societies of the time. Women could own property, initiate divorces, and even become merchants. The existence of shield maidens shows us that Viking society was complex, and their role was not just confined to the home, but extended to the battlefield. The tales of these Viking women warriors, these shield maidens, serve to broaden our understanding of Viking society. They remind us that history is full of surprises, 
and the roles we often take for granted were not always so clear-cut. In the end, the story of the Shield Maidens is a story of courage, strength, and defying expectations. And that's a story worth telling. When we talk about Vikings, we often focus on their golden era, the time of raiding, exploring, and trading. But like all great epochs in history, the Viking Age had to come to an end. So what exactly led to the decline of this powerful seafaring civilization? Many factors contributed to the end of the Viking Age, and it wasn't a sudden, abrupt stop. Instead, it was a gradual process that took place over several decades, beginning in the late 11th century. One of the key factors was the emergence of centralized kingdoms in Scandinavia. As these kingdoms consolidated their power, they started to control the Viking raids. The kings, wanting to maintain power and stability, discouraged the violent and disruptive raids that had characterized the Viking Age. A second significant factor was the spread of Christianity throughout Scandinavia. The Vikings had long held on to their Norse beliefs and pagan rituals. However, with increasing contact with Christian Europe, through trade, conquest and diplomacy, Christianity began to take root. Christian kings and leaders often sought to end the practice of raiding, seeing it as incompatible with their new faith. Over time, the conversion to Christianity played a significant role in calming the Viking spirit of adventure and aggression. Thirdly, the climatic conditions, which had been favorable for the Viking lifestyle, began to change. The medieval warm period, which had allowed for the expansion of settlements in places like Greenland, started to wane. This climatic downturn made farming more challenging and may have reduced the opportunities for exploration and settlement. Lastly, by the late 11th century, the regions that the Vikings had targeted, Europe, the British Isles, had become more fortified and better prepared to defend against Viking attacks. The targets of Viking raids had learned how to resist and retaliate. In essence, the end of the Viking Age wasn't marked by a single defining event. It was the result of many converging factors, political, religious, environmental and social, that together signalled the closing of this remarkable chapter in human history. But, while the Viking Age may have ended, the influence and legacy of the Vikings continue to be felt and discovered even today. Picture this. A ship embarks on a voyage across vast, uncharted waters carrying precious cargo. It's a story that has been told countless times throughout human history. But what happens when these journeys go awry, when the unexpected storm hits or the navigator loses his way? In today's exploration, we're diving deep into the mysteries of the ocean as we uncover the tales of five ancient shipwrecks. From lost treasures to ghostly apparitions and archaeological wonders, these sunken vessels hold secrets of the past that continue to fascinate us. Let's set sail on this maritime adventure. In the deep waters off the southern coast of Turkey lies the Uluburan shipwreck a time capsule from the Late Bronze Age that has been resting on the seafloor for over 3,300 years. Discovered in the early 1980s by a local sponge diver, the ship has been dated back to the 14th century BC, making it one of the oldest known shipwrecks. The ship was laden with a cargo that has provided an invaluable snapshot into the international trade of the era. Divers recovered over 10 tons of raw copper, tin ingots, the components of bronze, and a golden seal bearing the name of Egyptian Queen Nefertiti, providing hard evidence of a direct trade link between the Mycenaeans in Greece and the New Kingdom of Egypt. In addition, archaeologists found ivory hailing from both Africa and the Syrian elephant, amber from the Baltic, and a unique collection of glass beads traced back to Egypt and Mesopotamia. This suggests that the ship had traversed the length and breadth of the eastern Mediterranean before it sank. Also among the cargo were luxury items like ebony, ostrich eggshells, a scarab gem and a trumpet, indicating the high status of the intended recipients. Perhaps one of the most intriguing items found was a collection of the earliest known written tablets, hinting at a literate crew or owner. Picture this, a crisp autumn night, a glowing three-mast schooner sailing silently through the foggy waters of the Northumberland Strait. Between Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick in Canada, this isn't just any schooner, but a spectral vessel that has become the stuff of legend. The burning ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. Numerous accounts dating back to the 18th century tell of a ship appearing ablaze on the water, its ghostly crew scrambling to douse the flames. Despite the apparent inferno, 
The ship never seems to burn down, and it always disappears without a trace. Some theories suggest the ghost ship is a mirage, an optical phenomenon caused by temperature inversions. Others, however, believe it to be the spectral remnant of a real ship that met a fiery end. One popular theory is that the apparition is the spectre of a French ship that was set ablaze during the expulsion of the Acadians, a tragic event that took place in the mid-18th century. However, no concrete historical event or shipwreck has been definitively linked to the ghost ship sightings. While the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait may not have yielded physical treasure, it is undoubtedly a cultural and historical treasure. It has captivated generations, inspired folk songs, and continues to be a draw for ghost hunters and maritime history enthusiasts alike. The mystery of its origin and the ethereal nature of its existence make it a fascinating chapter in the annals of seafaring lore. Now, let's venture into the azure waters of the Mediterranean, to the island of Antikythera, between mainland Greece and Crete. This is the site of one of the most remarkable shipwrecks ever discovered, the Antikythera shipwreck. First discovered in 1900 by sponge divers, the ship is believed to have been a massive Greek cargo ship that sank sometime between 60 and 70 BCE. Laden with luxury goods, including marble and bronze statues, jewelry, furniture and glassware, it was a veritable floating treasure trove. But the real treasure, the one that would rewrite our understanding of ancient technology, was a peculiar artifact known as the Antikythera mechanism. This intricate device made of interlocking gears and dials is often described as the world's first analog computer. It was used to predict celestial events, including eclipses, as well as the positions of the planets. The complexity and precision of the Antikythera mechanism wouldn't be seen again for over a thousand years, challenging our conceptions of technological progress. The Antikythera shipwreck remains an active archaeological site, with new discoveries made as recently as 2017. This ancient sunken ship offers a tangible connection to the past and provides us with priceless insights into the sophistication of ancient Greek technology and culture. The Antikythera mechanism itself is a testament to the ingenuity of the human mind, a treasure far more valuable than gold. We now turn our attention to the high seas of the Atlantic, and a ship that played an integral part in one of history's most significant voyages, the Santa Maria, the flagship of Christopher Columbus on his first journey to the New World. Built in the late 15th century, the Santa Maria was a modest-sized NAU or ship, common during the Age of Discovery. On Christmas Eve of 1492, just months after Columbus and his crew sighted land in the New World, the Santa Maria ran aground off the coast of present-day Haiti, the ship was too damaged to be repaired and was left to the mercy of the sea. However, the shipwreck was not the end of the Santa Maria story. Using salvaged materials from the ship, Columbus ordered the construction of a fort, La Navidad, the first European settlement in the Americas. In a way, the Santa Maria lived on, becoming part of the very world it helped discover. Despite many attempts, the wreck of the Santa Maria has never been definitively located. Some believe it was dismantled by looters, while others argue that it may still lie undiscovered on the ocean floor. The search for the Santa Maria continues, its elusive remains a tantalizing target for treasure hunters and historians alike. A symbol of a turning point in world history, the Santa Maria and its potential discovery are treasures that would rewrite the history books. High in the Andes Mountains of South America, at an elevation of over 12,500 feet, 3,800 meters, lies Lake Titicaca, a massive body of water that straddles the border between Bolivia and Peru. This mystical lake, steeped in legends and folklore, has been the focus of numerous archaeological expeditions that have led to the discovery of fascinating underwater treasures. In recent years, researchers have been drawn to the lake due to reports of submerged ships and artifacts. Archaeologists and divers have been exploring the depths of Lake Titicaca, uncovering a series of shipwrecks and ancient relics dating back to pre-Columbian times. The most intriguing finds include a submerged temple, terraced fields, and a long-lost road, which allude to the advanced engineering and agricultural techniques of the ancient inhabitants of the region. The Titicaca shipwrecks themselves have also provided valuable information about the maritime technology of the time, the remains of reed boats and other watercraft suggest that the people of the area were skilled navigators who used the lake for trade, communication and cultural exchange. 
Some of these shipwrecks may even hold treasures, ritual offerings or valuable goods that were lost during their journeys across the lake. The exploration of the Titicaca shipwrecks is ongoing, and each new discovery adds another piece to the puzzle of the ancient civilizations that once thrived around this enigmatic lake. As archaeologists continue to unveil the secrets of Lake Titicaca, we gain a deeper understanding of the people who once navigated its waters and the treasures that may still lie hidden beneath the surface. The Vasa is one of the most famous shipwrecks in the world, not because of the treasures it held, but due to the invaluable insights it provides into the naval architecture and maritime warfare of the 17th century. This Swedish warship was intended to be a symbol of Sweden's naval prowess, but instead became a symbol of failure and humiliation. The Vasa set sail on her maiden voyage on August 10, 1628 in Stockholm, but disaster struck immediately. Within a mile of her departure, a gust of wind caused the top heavy ship to tilt, water entered through the open gun ports, and the Vasa sank in front of a horrified crowd of onlookers. The ship rested in the cold, brackish waters of Stockholm's harbour for over 330 years, its location known but its retrieval seen as impossible. However, in 1961, the Vasa was finally salvaged in an operation that sparked worldwide interest. The cold, low salinity conditions of the Baltic Sea had preserved the Vasa exceptionally well, with even the intricate wooden carvings and painted surfaces remaining largely intact. Today, the Vasa is housed in a specially built museum in Stockholm, where it provides an unparalleled glimpse into the past. While the Vasa didn't carry gold or jewels, it held a different kind of treasure knowledge. The ship and its contents, including thousands of artifacts and even the remains of the crew and their personal possessions, provide a time capsule of life in the early 17th century. Each object, from the cannons and rigging to the clothing and utensils, contributes to our understanding of the era's naval warfare, social conditions and everyday life. The story of the Vasa reminds us that sometimes the real treasure is not gold or gems, but the stories and lessons we glean from history. We've journeyed through time and across the globe, diving into the depths of history and the ocean to discover the captivating stories behind these shipwrecks. Each ship, each voyage, tells a unique tale of human ambition, innovation and often unexpected disaster. But in their underwater tombs, they've preserved snapshots of our past, treasures that surpass material wealth. They remind us that the real treasure isn't always gold or gems, but the stories and lessons we glean from history. So the next time you gaze across the ocean, remember the tales it holds beneath its waves. Until next time, keep exploring. Pirates, swashbuckling outlaws of the high seas, infamous for their rebellious lifestyle and thirst for treasure. But was pirate life really as it's portrayed in movies and books? Or was it perhaps a harsher reality fraught with danger and hardships? Today we're setting sail into the world of pirates, looking beyond the eye patches and parrots, and diving deep into the historical reality of pirate life. From their impressive ships, strict codes of conduct, and even the mystery surrounding their plundered riches. Let's embark on this maritime journey together. Let's delve deeper into the world of pirate ships. Contrary to popular belief, pirates didn't always sail the massive galleons we often see in films or storybooks. Those ships were incredibly large and slow, making them easy targets for naval forces and privateers. Instead, pirates often favoured smaller, faster vessels like sloops and brigs. Sloops were particularly popular for their speed and manoeuvrability. These single-masted vessels were quick and could easily navigate the coastal waters where pirates often found their prey. They could also escape into shallow waters, where larger naval vessels couldn't follow. Brigs, on the other hand, were slightly larger, boasting two masts. They were a bit slower than sloops, but could carry more crew and cargo, making them ideal for longer voyages or larger pirate crews. Whichever type they chose, pirates would modify their ships to suit their needs. This often meant removing unnecessary cabins or structures to make room for more crew members and cargo. They would also mount cannons for both offence and defence, turning these relatively modest vessels into formidable warships, it's also worth noting that most pirate ships were not built, but rather taken. Pirates would often seize a suitable ship during their raids, then modify it to suit their needs. This not only saved them the effort and resources of building their own ship, but it also allowed them to continually upgrade their vessel as they came across better and more powerful ships during their voyages. 
Maritime life in the golden age of piracy was far from the romanticized version we often see in popular culture. A discipline was harsh, and punishments for breaking the pirate code were brutal. These rules, often decided upon and agreed to by the crew, were necessary to maintain order on a ship full of ruthless men. The most well-known pirate punishment is probably walking the plank, but surprisingly, this is more myth than reality. While there are a few documented cases, it was not a common practice. Instead, pirates employed a variety of other punishments. Flogging was one of the more common methods of punishment. The wrongdoer would be tied up and whipped with a cat o' nine tails, a whip made of nine knotted ropes. This brutal punishment could leave a man weak, bloody, and in some cases even dead. Keel hauling was another horrific punishment. A rope would be tied to the sailor, who would then be thrown overboard. The rope was then pulled, dragging the unfortunate soul under the ship across the barnacle-covered bottom. This could result in severe lacerations and quite often drowning. Marooning was perhaps the most feared punishment of all. The offender would be left on a deserted island or a remote sandbar with little more than a bottle of water and a loaded pistol. The pistol was not for self-defense, but rather to offer the marooned pirate a quicker death than starvation or exposure. However, it wasn't all brute force. Sometimes punishments were psychological. Pirates would sometimes employ sweating, where the crew would chase the offender around the ship or up and down the mast until they were exhausted. These punishments were harsh, but pirates lived in harsh conditions and harsh times. Discipline was necessary to prevent chaos, and these severe punishments served as a stark reminder of the consequences of disobedience. Let's dive deeper into the life of a pirate. Far from the romanticized, swashbuckling adventurers of fiction, the reality of pirate life was tough, dangerous, and often short-lived. The typical pirate was a working-class man in his late twenties. Most pirates started their seafaring careers as legitimate sailors, fishermen, or privateers, which were basically legal pirates with a government contract. Life at sea was their trade, and when they turned to piracy, it was often for economic reasons. Simply put, piracy paid better. Pirate ships were small communities unto themselves, with their own rules and hierarchies. Each crew member had a role, from the captain and the quartermaster to the boatswain, gunner, and cook. Every man was expected to do his job, and in return he received a share of any plunder. This was one of the more egalitarian aspects of pirate life. The loot was usually divided fairly, a stark contrast to the strict class divisions of mainstream society. The pirate's day would start at dawn, with the ship's bell signalling the beginning of the working day. The crew would work on maintaining the ship, navigating and looking out for potential prizes. Meals were simple and usually consisted of hardtack, a type of long-lasting biscuit, salted meat or fish, and grog, a mixture of rum and water. Despite the harsh conditions, pirates did find time for entertainment. Music was an essential part of pirate life, with shanties sung to keep rhythm during work and instruments played for evening entertainment. Pirates also gambled, although this was often banned while at sea due to the potential for fights. Another popular misconception is that pirates were constantly engaged in battle. In reality, most pirate attacks were more like muggings than battles. Pirates preferred to target weaker, undefended merchant ships and most of their victims surrendered without a fight. When they did fight, it was brutal and bloody with pirates using a mix of firearms and cutlasses. Pirate life was a combination of long periods of boredom, punctuated by intense moments of terror and excitement. It was a hard life, with the ever-present threat of death by disease, violence, or execution if captured. But for those who chose it, piracy offered a taste of freedom and adventure that was hard to find in the rigid society of the time. Ah, pirate treasure. It's the stuff of legends and probably what comes to mind when you think of pirates. Buried chests full of gold and jewels hidden on some deserted island waiting to be found. But how much of this is fact and how much is fiction? Firstly, let's talk about the loot. The primary goal of piracy was to obtain wealth, and pirates would target ships carrying valuable cargo. This could include gold and silver, but also items like spices, silk, tobacco, and even slaves. In fact, these goods were often more common than precious metals and gemstones, as they were the main commodities being transported across the seas during the Age of Exploration. Once a ship was captured, the pirates would take everything they could— this not only included the cargo, but also any personal valuables from the passengers and crew. 
In some cases, they would even take the clothes off their victims' backs. Everything had a value, and everything was divided among the crew according to their agreed shares. But what about burying the treasure? This is a staple of pirate law popularized by stories like Treasure Island. However, in reality, it was quite rare. Pirates lived a precarious and often short life with no guarantee of a future. When they got their hands on wealth, they tended to spend it quickly, often on drink, gambling, and women in port towns. Why bury your treasure when you could be spending it? There are a few documented cases of pirates burying their loot, but it was the exception rather than the rule. The most famous is probably Captain William Kidd, who buried part of his treasure on Gardner's Island, New York, in an attempt to use it as a bargaining chip when he was captured. As for the vast pirate hordes waiting to be discovered, they are likely just a myth. Most of the treasure that wasn't spent was probably lost at sea, scattered across the ocean floor with the many pirate ships that sank, so while the dream of finding a buried pirate chest is an exciting one, it's probably just that a dream. Life at sea, especially in the golden age of piracy, was an experience unlike any other. But was it all sea shanties and swashbuckling? Let's set sail into the realities of pirate life. Firstly, the ocean wasn't just a wide-open playground. It was, and still is, a treacherous place. Pirates had to contend with storms, disease, shipwrecks, and other dangers. Not to mention the constant threat of naval patrols and pirate hunters, the life expectancy for a pirate wasn't particularly high, and many met their end at the gallows or at the bottom of the sea. And then there was the daily routine. Contrary to the Hollywood image of pirates always engaged in battles or revelry, much of their time was spent on the monotonous tasks necessary to keep the ship sailing. This included cleaning, maintaining the ship, navigating, and keeping watch. Pirates also had to ration their supplies, especially during long voyages. Their diet mainly consisted of hardtack, a type of hard, dry biscuit, salted meat, and whatever fruits or vegetables they could keep from spoiling. Water was often scarce and it wasn't uncommon for pirates to resort to drinking alcohol when their water supplies ran low. This led to a fair amount of drunkenness on board, which could cause its own set of problems. Living conditions were cramped, with the crew sleeping wherever they could find space. Hygiene was minimal at best, and disease was rampant. Scurvy, a disease caused by a deficiency of vitamin C, was a common affliction, as were other illnesses and infections. Medical treatment was rudimentary, and a serious injury or illness was often a death sentence. Despite these hardships, there was a certain sense of freedom that came with a pirate's life. They were outlaws, living outside the boundaries of society. They elected their own leaders, shared in their plunder, and lived by their own code. For some, this was a preferable alternative to a life of servitude on a naval or merchant vessel. However, the reality of life at sea was harsh, and not for the faint of heart— it was a life of constant risk, hardship, and danger, but for those who embraced it, it was a life of adventure, camaraderie, and the lure of untold riches, a pirate's life indeed. We've navigated through the tumultuous seas of pirate history, discovering that behind the romanticized depictions lie tales of hardship, survival, and a thirst for freedom. Pirates, in their own unconventional way, truly were masters of the sea, living life on their own terms outside societal norms, but their existence was far from the carefree, treasure-filled escapade often depicted. It was a life fraught with danger, disease, and the ever-looming shadow of a violent end. So, the next time you think about hoisting the Jolly Roger, remember it's not all sea shanties and buried treasure. Imagine a ship once robust and filled with life, now drifting aimlessly, uninhabited and silent through the vast icy expanses of the North Atlantic, or resting in an eternal slumber on a foreign shoreline. The image is unsettling, isn't it? It's a stark reminder of our mortality and the inevitable march of time. Today we delve into the eerie world of abandoned ships, ghostly giants of the sea whose stories continue to captivate and mystify us. Welcome to a voyage into the unknown, as we explore the chilling tales of the MV Lubov Orlova and the SS American Star. Have you ever thought about the life of a ship after it's decommissioned? Well, some vessels lead a pretty interesting afterlife, like the MV Lyubov Orlova. This colossal 300-foot cruise ship, named after the famous Soviet actress Lyubov Petrovna Orlova, was built in Yugoslavia in 1976. It was a magnificent vessel designed to explore the polar regions. But as we're about to see, the ice-cold seas would ultimately become its chilling resting place. 
the Lyubov Orlova was seized in 2010 in Newfoundland, Canada, due to a debt dispute. After being docked for two years, it was sold to a Dominican buyer for scrap in 2012. However, while being towed to the Dominican Republic, the tow line snapped in heavy seas, and the ship began drifting eastward into international waters. From then, the Lyubov Orlova became known as the Ghost Ship of the Arctic. Despite repeated attempts to secure the ship, it proved elusive. Powered only by currents and winds, this ghost ship roamed the seas, its exact whereabouts often unknown. There were rumors and reports suggesting that the ship may have finally sunk, but without firm evidence, its fate remained a maritime mystery. As for exploration, it's not just about the thrill of discovery. Safety is paramount, and the Lyubov Orlova, abandoned for years and battered by the elements, presented too many risks. Its interior spaces would have deteriorated significantly, and structural integrity would be questionable at best. There's also the consideration of legal rights to a vessel adrift in international waters. Besides, there's a much creepier aspect to consider. The ship was rumored to be infested with cannibal rats. Yes, you heard that right. Left without a food source, the rats aboard would have turned to cannibalism. It's a frightening thought, a ship full of potentially diseased cannibal rats roaming the high seas, Despite the creepy fascination and mystery surrounding it, the MV Lyubov Orlova remains a chilling reminder of the unpredictable forces of nature and the ghostly afterlife that some ships can lead once they've outlived their intended purpose. We may never know what really happened to it, and maybe that's for the best. After all, who's ready to tackle a potential rat-infested ghost ship? If you thought that was it for the Lyubov Orlova, well, the plot thickens, my friends. After disappearing into the fog, the fate of this ghost ship was a mystery that stirred up the imagination of many and resulted in several chilling theories and reported sightings. In January 2013, the ship was spotted 250 nautical miles off the coast of Ireland by the Atlantic Hawk, an offshore supply ship under contract to Husky Energy. The crew managed to secure it with a tow line, but authorities soon ordered them to release it, citing the lack of danger to offshore oil installations or shipping traffic. So, once again, the Lyubov Orlova was left to drift aimlessly. Rumors started to circulate about its location. Sightings were reported, though unconfirmed, some as far off as the coasts of Scotland and Norway. People began to speculate about it reaching the shores of Ireland or the United Kingdom, fueled by satellite images in 2013 suggesting a large object was drifting towards the UK. One of the most chilling theories was that the ship, adrift and abandoned, could be on a collision course with the oil rigs in the North Sea. Can you imagine an unmanned, dilapidated ship of this size causing a catastrophe on an oil rig? A true maritime horror story. And then there were those cannibal rats. The thought of a ship teeming with such desperate creatures stirred the imagination and was stuff for nightmares, let alone the disease threat they could potentially carry if the ship ever made landfall. As for exploration, despite the allure of a ghost ship shrouded in mystery, it remained unexplored due to the considerable risks involved. Its structural instability, unpredictable location, and the potential rat infestation made it a less than desirable candidate for a safe exploration. But here's where the story takes an eerie turn. The Lyubov Orlova suddenly stopped transmitting its location signal in March 2013. From that point on, it vanished without a trace. Many experts now believe that it probably sank, put to rest in the deep, dark depths of the Atlantic Ocean. But without concrete proof, the true fate of this ghost ship remains as elusive as its last known journey. The MV Lyubov Orlova's story serves as a haunting reminder of what happens when man-made structures are left to the mercy of nature's elements, evolving from a symbol of human achievement to a phantom adrift in the vastness of the ocean, its tail etched in the annals of maritime lore. Imagine a ship, an ocean liner no less, one that once gleamed with the promise of opulence and grand voyages, now reduced to a skeletal wreckage. We're taking a leap across the Atlantic, to a beach off the coast of Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands, to find our next shipwreck, the SS American Star. Originally launched in 1939 as SS America, this ship had quite an illustrious career. In its heyday, the SS American Star was a symbol of elegance and a testament to the grand era of ocean liners. But what makes the American Star so captivating is not the voyages it undertook, but rather its final resting place, 
1993, the ship was being towed from Greece to Thailand to be converted into a floating hotel when a thunderstorm severed the tow lines, casting the ship adrift. For 48 hours, it was battered by stormy seas until it ran aground off the west coast of Fuerteventura. The ship, once a beacon of luxury, was left stranded, half-submerged and at the mercy of the elements, slowly disintegrating under the relentless assault of waves and time. What remains today is just a haunting ghost of its former self. It's a sight that's both beautiful and sad, a stark contrast to the picturesque beaches of the Canary Islands. A shipwreck on a beach, well within reach of the shore, might seem like an explorer's dream, right? Not quite. Although the SS American Star is visible from the shore, exploring it is a different ballgame. It's a dangerous endeavor, one filled with unexpected hazards. The ship has been subject to intense coastal erosion. Salt water, waves and wind have worn down its structures, rendering the ship extremely unstable. Over the years, sections of the ship have collapsed, vanishing beneath the waves. By 2007, the ship had broken in two with the stern section completely submerged. What's more, the local currents and the surf are incredibly powerful and unpredictable, posing a serious risk for any who dare to approach the wreckage. Although the site has attracted its fair share of adventurous souls over the years, it's strongly discouraged due to these dangers. But the power of the SS American Star story lies not in its exploration, but in its visible decay. It serves as a sobering spectacle, a lesson in the relentless power of nature. From the shore, onlookers can witness the ship's transformation from a once proud ocean liner into a symbol of entropy, its silhouette slowly fading with each passing day. An eerie monument to the passage of time. There's something hauntingly beautiful about the American Star. Its decaying remains, jutting out from the surf, paint a poignant picture of a bygone era, etching its ghostly outline onto the canvas of maritime history. But more than that, the ship serves as a tangible reminder of our transience in the face of nature's relentless force. But what happened after the SS American Star ran aground? Did the elements eventually consume the once proud ship? Well, much like the city of Venice, the SS American Star found itself in a battle against time and tide, in a slow, inevitable descent into the sea. After the shipwreck in 1994, the ship became a bizarre tourist attraction, visible from the shores of Fuerteventura. Tourists would flock to the beach to catch a glimpse of the ship's silhouette against the horizon, and more daring adventurers would kayak out to the wreck for a closer look. However, the SS American Star was not just an object of fascination for humans, it also became a haven for various forms of marine life. Coral began to grow on its hull, attracting a variety of fish, and over the years the shipwreck slowly transformed into a makeshift artificial reef. As strange as it might sound, even in its derelict state, the SS American Star found a way to contribute to life. However, the harsh conditions of the Atlantic were relentless. The battering of the waves, the corrosive salt water, the gusty winds, all of these factors began to take their toll on the ship. In 2007, barely a decade after it had run aground, the ship broke in half due to the constant onslaught of the elements. And by 2013, the majority of the ship had sunk beneath the waves, disappearing from the sight of the beachgoers who had been drawn to its eerie beauty. Today, almost nothing of the SS American Star remains visible above water. The once majestic ship is now a hidden underwater relic, visited only by intrepid divers and its non-human inhabitants. Its final resting place serves as a haunting reminder of the ship's once illustrious history and a testament to the relentless power of nature. It's a story that continues to captivate, even as the ship itself fades away, slowly being reclaimed by the sea from which it once emerged. And so, our maritime journey comes to an end. We've navigated the chilling tales of the MV Lyubov Orlova, the ghost ship of the North Atlantic and the SS American Star, whose remains now lie hidden beneath the waves off the coast of Fuerteventura. These hulking vessels, once brimming with life and purpose, now serve as stark reminders of our past and the relentless forces of time and nature. They captivate our imaginations, not just as tales of derelict ships, but as stories of human ambition, triumph, and ultimately, surrender to the elements. As we bid them farewell, these ghostly giants of the sea continue their silent vigil, carrying with them the echoes of bygone eras into the vast, uncharted waters of the future. The call of the unknown, the allure of uncharted territory, the thrill of new discovery. They're powerful motivators. 
They have driven us to the depths of the oceans, to the peaks of the highest mountains, and even out into the farthest reaches of space. But sometimes the unknown bites back. Today we're stepping into the icy, desolate, yet mesmerizing world of Antarctica, and our guides for this chilling journey are none other than the brave or perhaps the foolhardy crew of the Belgica, who embarked on a perilous Antarctic expedition in the late 19th century. What can their ill-fated voyage teach us about human perseverance, the power of ingenuity and the high price of exploration? Let's dive in. Picture this, it's August 1897, a sturdy oak-framed ship with triple-sheathed hull named Belgica embarks from the historic city of Antwerp, Belgium. This three-masted vessel, constructed with the strength to withstand the fierce Antarctic conditions, was destined to be a part of history as it set sail under the Belgian flag. The expedition was captained by Adrien de Galache, a driven, audacious 31-year-old Belgian naval officer. It was his spirit of adventure that prompted him to invest his personal fortune into this expedition. His motivation was not mere territorial conquest, as it was with so many explorers of the age. No, de Gerlach was driven by scientific curiosity, with the intention to explore the largely uncharted Antarctic region and contribute to the understanding of its mysterious icy wilderness. The crew, handpicked by de Gerlach himself, was as diverse as they were courageous. The Belgica was manned by an international team, which included the American doctor Frederick Cook and Roald Amundsen a young Norwegian who would later be famed for leading the first successful expedition to the South Pole. As the Belgica cut through the North Sea, and later through the unforgiving waters of the South Atlantic, excitement among the crew was palpable. They were bound by a shared sense of purpose, each man knowing that they were on the brink of a groundbreaking expedition that could expand the world as they knew it. But, as they would soon discover, Antarctica's icy seas had other plans. Upon reaching the Antarctic waters, the Belgica was greeted with a sight that was as beautiful as it was eerie. Massive icebergs floated like spectral monoliths in the ocean, their peaks illuminated by the ethereal Antarctic light. The silence of the landscape was broken only by the harsh scraping of ice against the Belgica's reinforced hull. These first encounters with the Antarctic landscape served as a chilling reminder of the perils that lay ahead. On February 28, 1898, the Belgica got entrapped in the Antarctic pack ice. The crew watched with growing concern as the sea around them turned into a vast plain of solid ice. Trapped far from civilization, in a sea frozen into immobility, the Belgica and her crew were left to the mercy of the unforgiving Antarctic winter. Imagine the psychological impact this would have had on the crew. Trapped in an icy prison, with the darkness of the polar night descending upon them. The crew had to face the unsettling reality that they were stuck in the ice with no means of escape. However, as daunting as their predicity was, de Gerlach insisted on maintaining scientific operations. The crew continued to take meteorological and magnetic readings, hunted for penguins and seals, and dug ice tunnels for temperature readings. In many ways, the Belgica's enforced halt turned it into an ad hoc polar research station. For the next several months, the ship was enveloped in almost continuous darkness. The days and nights blurred into an unending twilight, punctuated only by the green and pink flickers of the Aurora Australis. The stunning beauty of the southern lights offered a stark contrast to the bleak reality of their predicament. The Belgica was lost in the coldest place on Earth, with no guarantee of ever escaping its icy grip. As the full severity of the Antarctic winter began to set in, life aboard the Belgica became increasingly grim. The lack of sunlight and the monotony of the ice-locked seascape took a toll on the crew's mental health. The polar night, with its unending darkness, is psychologically unnerving in a way few of us can truly understand. The temperature outside regularly plunged below minus 30 degrees Celsius, which was so cold that it caused the ship's outer hull to groan and creak as it contracted. The men had to take shifts to chip away the ice accumulating on the ship's exterior to prevent it from being crushed. Their diet, consisting largely of tinned food, was hardly appetizing or nutritious, and it began to affect their health. Scurvy, caused by vitamin C deficiency, began to appear among the crew. The ship's cat, Nansen, named after the famed Norwegian explorer, sadly became one of the first victims, losing its life to the freezing conditions. 
Conditions worsened when the ship's doctor, Frederick Cook, identified the first signs of polar madness, or polar hysteria as he termed it, among the crew. The unending darkness, extreme cold and monotonous isolated conditions led to symptoms of severe depression, anxiety and paranoia. Cook was not just the ship's doctor but also its psychologist, treating both the physical and psychological illnesses on board. The grim winter brought them face to face not just with physical hardships, but a psychological battle of endurance. In these harsh conditions, the men had to fight not just for survival but for their sanity as well. When faced with such a daunting survival situation, the crew of the Belgica had to get creative. Dr. Cook, realizing the lack of vitamins in their diet, suggested hunting for fresh meat. The frozen wasteland was not completely devoid of life, and they were able to supplement their diet with Antarctic seabirds and penguins, dramatically improving their health. Crew morale was another critical issue to address. Imagine being stuck in a cold, dark, monotonous environment for an extended period. The psychological stress is unimaginable. To counter this, the crew initiated a daily routine that included chores, scientific work and even social activities. Regular meals, group reading sessions and music performances were organized to break the monotony and bring some semblance of normalcy. In addition to fight the darkness-induced depression, a rudimentary light therapy was devised. Sunlight, or its absence, can significantly impact our mood, sleep and overall well-being. Recognizing this, Dr. Cook installed a light room where the crew members could bathe in the light emitted by the ship's carbon arc lamps, simulating sunlight and staving off the worst effects of the polar darkness. This creative solution was, in essence, one of the earliest uses of phototherapy, a practice now widespread in modern medicine to treat conditions like seasonal affective disorder. Despite these measures, surviving the harsh Antarctic winter was not an easy task. The crew battled frostbite, near starvation, madness and despair. Some of them, such as the Belgian sailor Augusta Karl Wienke, tragically didn't make it. But against all odds, most of the crew survived, waiting desperately for the summer thaw to free their ship from the ice's grip. Finally, after months of grueling hardship, the summer sun began to peak over the horizon, hinting at the end of the long Antarctic winter. But despite the slight warming, the Belgica remained firmly trapped in the ice. Survival had shifted into another phase, escape. Dr. Cook and Amundsen, already having demonstrated remarkable leadership in maintaining the crew's morale and health, now turned their attention to freeing the Belgica from its icy prison. They understood that waiting passively could mean another winter trapped in the ice, a scenario they knew the crew could not survive, so they devised a plan to manually break and saw the ice around the Belgica. It was a monumental task given the ice was several feet thick and the ship was trapped for nearly a mile's length. Armed with pickaxes, saws and shovels, the crew labored diligently, chipping away at the frozen ocean. They even attempted to blast the ice with explosives, only to find the shock could damage the Belgica's hull. After weeks of grueling labor, they made progress. The crew, in a feat of extraordinary determination, carved a channel nearly 900 meters long and wide enough for the Belgica to pass through. However, there was another obstacle. The ship's engines, unused and unmaintained for more than a year, were in dire condition. But with some improvised repairs and the combined strength of the desperate crew, they managed to get the engines working just enough. On February 15, 1899, the crew of the Belgica, tired, worn but unbroken, began their journey through the channel they had carved. With the ship shuddering and groaning against the pressure of the ice, they made slow progress. It was an arduous and nerve-wracking journey. But on March 14, 1899, more than a year after they first became trapped, the Belgica finally broke free from the ice and sailed into the open waters of the Antarctic Ocean, marking the end of their harrowing ordeal. This escape from the ice was not just a triumph over the harsh Antarctic environment, it was a testament to human resilience, ingenuity and the indomitable will to survive. Despite the odds, they had managed to turn a desperate situation into a story of survival and scientific discovery. And in doing so, the crew of the Belgica etched their names into the annals of polar exploration. The Belgica expedition may have been a harrowing and grueling ordeal, but its impact extends far beyond the survival story. 
the team led by the indomitable Gerlach and Cook collected a wealth of scientific data that would contribute significantly to our understanding of Antarctica. The crew's observations, measurements and samples help shape the scientific community's perceptions of the world's most remote and inhospitable continent. They catalogued new species, took extensive meteorological data and mapped parts of the Antarctic coast, providing a foundation for future expeditions. Moreover, the psychological impact of the long, dark winter and the crew's struggle with polar madness contributed to an early understanding of seasonal affective disorder. Cook's method of using a carefully balanced diet to combat scurvy would inform future Antarctic expeditions and change maritime health practices. And so the saga of the Belgica serves as a chilling reminder of the cost of venturing into the unknown, the fine line between bravery and folly, and the incredible feats humans can accomplish in the face of adversity. The crew of the Belgica didn't conquer Antarctica. Instead, they fell victim to its unforgiving nature. Yet, through perseverance, teamwork and a good deal of desperate ingenuity, they overcame their ordeal, offering us an awe-inspiring testament to human resilience. As we gaze upon the vast expanse of the Antarctic through their eyes, we are humbly reminded that the unknown still holds many secrets and challenges, even as our thirst for exploration continues. Have you ever gazed out onto the horizon over the vast expanse of the ocean and wondered what mysteries it might hold? This immense body of water, covering over 70% of our Earth's surface, has been a source of fascination, fear and awe since the dawn of humanity. Tales of ghost ships and missing vessels have peppered our history, leaving a trail of questions in their wake. So what happens when a ship embarks on a voyage and simply disappears? Today, we are going to delve into the watery tales of nautical disappearances. Journeys that started like any other, but ended up etching a permanent question mark on the canvas of maritime history. What if I told you that there exists a ghost ship that has sailed the icy waters of the Arctic Ocean unmanned for over 200 years? The ghost ship Octavius, as it has been famously named, is more than just a nautical myth. It's a haunting tale of a ship, her crew, and their chilling fate. In 1761, the Octavius set sail from England for the Orient. Led by a daring captain eager to find a shorter route to Asia, the ship ventured into the treacherous waters of the Northwest Passage. Now, this was in a time long before any serious attempts were made to navigate the passage and definitely before anyone knew about the disastrous effects of frostbite and hypothermia. The Octavius successfully reached its destination and started its homeward voyage in 1762. But instead of using the typical trade route, the captain decided to gamble on the unpredictable Northwest Passage. Winter came early that year, trapping the Octavius and its crew in a deadly icy grip. Now, here's where it gets eerie. The ship was next seen on October 11th, 1775, by the crew of the whaling ship Herald. The Herald's crew boarded the drifting Octavius, and what they found was a frozen world of 18th century seafaring. The ship was still intact, but inside they discovered the entire crew frozen solid, perfectly preserved in the below zero temperatures, with the captain reportedly still at his desk, pen in hand, finishing a log entry dated 1762. According to maritime law, the crew of the Herald was so disturbed by the sight that they left the Octavius adrift in the Arctic waters, where it's said to be still floating to this day. An unsolved mystery, a chilling maritime ghost story, or a cautionary tale about the unforgiving nature of the sea in the Arctic's frigid waters. The enduring legend of the ghost ship Octavius continues to capture our imagination with these very questions. The Bermuda Triangle, a mystery shrouded in the azure depths of the Atlantic. This infamous zone, also known as the Devil's Triangle, is roughly a triangular region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean, where a startling number of aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under unexplained circumstances. The Bermuda Triangle's law, as you've probably heard, is rich with tales of vanishing ships and airplanes. But what's more captivating is the wide variety of theories proposed to explain these disappearances. Some believe it's purely a work of fiction, an accumulation of maritime accidents that's been blown out of proportion. However, for others, it's a haven of mystery and paranormal activity, with explanations ranging from electromagnetic anomalies disrupting navigation systems to the even more outlandish extraterrestrial kidnappings. It's been said that compass problems are frequent in the Triangle, adding another level of intrigue to this puzzling region. But consider this. 
Despite the fear and speculation, the US government does not officially recognize the Bermuda Triangle as an actual geographic region or a threat to travelers. The US Board of Geographic Names doesn't have the Bermuda Triangle on its register, and the US Navy asserts that no supernatural explanations are needed, as the incidents were likely caused by natural, explainable phenomena. Scientific evaluations too lean toward rational explanations such as human error, piracy, equipment failure or natural disasters. Renowned science communicator Carl Sagan even pointed out that the Bermuda Triangle's mystery is a myth, arguing that considering the heavy traffic of the region, the number of incidents is not disproportionate. And yet, despite all the rational explanations, the Bermuda Triangle continues to ignite our curiosity. The unanswered questions continue to echo through the waves, capturing our imaginations. Maybe, just maybe, there's more to this story than the facts can tell. Let's turn our eyes to a bigger vessel, the USS Cyclops, one of the greatest maritime mysteries in US history. Commissioned during the First World War, the USS Cyclops was a massive fuel ship, one of the largest of her time. In March 1918, the Cyclops set sail from Barbados, bound for Baltimore, Maryland, laden with over 10,000 tons of manganese ore used in steelmaking. The Cyclops was a proud beast of steel and iron, stretching over 540 feet, and hosting a crew of 306 souls. It was on a crucial mission to fuel the war effort, and yet it disappeared without a trace. It left no distress call, no wreckage, no survivors. The ship and her entire crew vanished as though plucked from the fabric of reality itself. An extensive search by the US Navy found no trace of the ship, making it the single largest loss of life in US naval history not directly involving combat, Theories as to the ship's fate range from the practical to the supernatural. Some believe that structural issues or overloading might have led to a catastrophic failure. Others think that wartime enemy action might be responsible, though Germany denied any knowledge of the vessel. Then there are the more speculative theories. The ship's route would have taken it through the area known as the Bermuda Triangle, a region infamous for mysterious disappearances of ships and aircraft. Could the Cyclops have fallen victim to the same strange forces that claimed so many others? Or perhaps, as some suggest, a giant squid or sea monster dragged the Cyclops into the abyss. The loss of the USS Cyclops remains a disturbing mystery. Despite a century of technological advances, we are no closer to understanding what happened to the ship and its crew. Now what about a modern tale? Let's dive into the strange case of the Kaz-2, a story that takes us to the waters of Australia in 2007. The Kaz-2, also known as the Ghost Yacht, adds a technological spin to our list of maritime mysteries. The Kaz-2 was a 9.8-meter catamaran set to embark on a journey around Australia. On board were three friends, skipper Derek Batten and brothers Peter and James Tunstead. On April 15th, they set sail, bidding farewell to their families and looking forward to the adventure that awaited them. Two days later, the Kaz-2 was spotted drifting aimlessly off the coast of Australia. The eerie part was that everything on the boat seemed normal. The engine was running, a laptop was open and still turned on. The table was set for dinner and life jackets hung untouched. But of the three friends, there was no sign. It was as if they had simply vanished. An extensive air and sea search was conducted over the following weeks, covering over 4,000 square miles, but no trace of the men was ever found. The authorities were baffled. How could three experienced sailors disappear from a yacht in calm seas without even having time to send a distress signal or put on life jackets? The theories are numerous, ranging from a sudden freak wave that swept the men off the boat to more far-fetched ideas like alien abduction or a government cover-up. Whatever the case, the mystery of the Kaz-2 has confounded experts and armchair detectives alike, leaving us with more questions than answers. The Mary Celeste, a tale that has baffled and intrigued us for nearly a century and a half. On November 7, 1872, the Mary Celeste, an American merchant brigantine, embarked from New York to Genoa, Italy. The captain, Benjamin Briggs, was an experienced seaman, accompanied by his wife, daughter, and a crew of seven. The cargo, 1,701 barrels of industrial alcohol, destined for fortifying Italian wines. About a month later, on December 4th, the DEI Gracia, a Canadian vessel, spotted the Mary Celeste adrift in the choppy seas of the Atlantic, roughly halfway between the Azores and the coast of Portugal. Uh, the ship was in good condition and seaworthy. 
The cargo was intact and there was plenty of food and water. The ship's logbook's last entry from 10 days earlier showed nothing unusual, but the crew, the captain and his family were gone. No signs of a struggle or violence, no indication of an outbreak of disease. A sword sheathed and unstained, a child's doll left mid-play on the cabin floor. Meals were set as if they were ready to eat. Everything indicated an orderly ship, save for the complete absence of its inhabitants. What's even more unsettling is that the ship's lifeboat was missing, along with a navigational device called a marine chronometer. This could suggest that the crew and the Briggs family voluntarily abandoned the ship. But why would they do so, leaving behind their belongings and a vessel in perfectly good condition? Over the years, theories have abounded, from piracy and mutiny to sea monsters and UFOs. Some suspect the vapors from the alcohol cargo may have caused an explosion that panicked the crew into the lifeboat, which then drifted or was lost at sea. But without hard evidence, all remain speculations. And the mystery of the Mary Celeste, it seems, is a secret the ocean keeps well. Let's switch gears. This next mystery, taking us all the way to the Pacific Ocean, revolves around a merchant vessel known as the MV Joyita. Known as the Mary Celeste of the South Pacific, the MV Joyita's tale is a chilling reminder of how the sea can turn into a theater of inexplicable disappearances. The MV Joyita set sail from Samoa's Apia Harbor on October 3, 1955, with 25 passengers and crew aboard. It was scheduled to arrive in the Tokelau Islands, some 270 miles away after a 48-hour voyage. However, the ship never reached its destination. When the Joyita was late, initial concerns weren't high. Delays were common due to the vessel's notoriously unreliable engines. But after days passed without word from the ship, a large-scale search and rescue operation was launched. Despite scouring over 100,000 square miles of ocean, there was no sign of the Joyita or its passengers. It wasn't until five weeks later that the Joyita was found adrift some 600 miles off its intended course. But, like many of our previous tales, the ship was eerily deserted. The crew and passengers had vanished. And that wasn't all. The ship was in a disturbing state. It was listing heavily to port due to a failed clutch on the port engine. Four tons of cargo was missing, and the radio, which had a range of 2,000 miles, was tuned to the International Distress Channel. However, there was no logbook to provide clues about what happened. Theories as to what happened range from mutiny to pirate attacks to the ship being caught up in an illegal fishing operation gone wrong. Despite extensive investigations, the mystery of the Joyita and its lost souls remains unsolved. The sea had swallowed up the clues and the MV Joyita became another ghost ship, haunting the vast expanse of the ocean with its tale of inexplicable loss. And so, our voyage into the chilling mysteries of the sea draws to a close. From the Octavius in the frosty Arctic, through the sinister waters of the Bermuda Triangle. Keep questioning, keep wondering, and as always, thanks for watching.